couple of questions for me, because I think from, from my point of view, obviously I work for a production company, and um, it's great. I really like these events because I get to actually meet people who do all sorts of different things in the industry, and I basically set me in this scenario. I get to ask any question I want, and I have to answer. Um, just starting with training, start with Donna. Um, who do you get to, you kind of mentioned this a bit before about backing up, who do you get to back up and does it vary on each individual production and how do you actually train them? Do you send them out to other places to train or do you train them in-house and how do you manage that whole process? Okay. So as it stands at the moment, we do do the training in-house, but before we could do the training in-house, we obviously needed to be trained ourselves. So uh, we leaned heavily on the camera companies, both that we were hiring from. So if you're, if you're going to hire your cameras, use the expertise of those companies who will offer you or should offer you free training if you're going to do some camera hire through them. Um, and if you're buying your cameras, then get that training and support from the company that you're actually buying it from. Um, and really shop around. You know, if a, if a company won't offer you training, there's loads out there that would... Um, and, and you can get it for free if, you, uh, if you've got some business to put their way. So if, if you do need training, try and get it for free um, through the people that you're actually getting your cameras from. Uh, just, just one other thing as well. I mean, with regards to uh, getting the camera guys involved, we always advise if you've got uh, any... Um, concerns about your production we, we always have like suites free where you can come in bring some media and just have a look at the and test the workflow and just make sure it all works and, and generally the camera hire companies are pretty good with that sort of thing as well um, my next question is about hard drives now I know Choppy spent um, a while on hard drives um, but and I've asked the question before but I'm going to ask it for this audience it seems that the kind of weak link in, in all of this chain is the fact that hard drives shared storage and everything that we're kind of starting to rely on, certainly as we're moving into taking moving more into digital, we're starting to rely on, rely on remote hard drives that are relatively cheap, I would say, but even relying on, on graded storage, it seems they are the weakest link in this chain, the fact that they will, that the only guarantee that you have with them is that they do fail. Is there any future ideas to, do you think there's anything coming in the future that will make that better? I mean, you've, you kind of had on your presentation that RAID 5, RAID 6, do you think that's going to keep going up and up and up? So actually, if two drives fail in the future, I'll be okay, rather than just one drive failing at the moment. Is that, I'm hoping that reliability will improve with time? Yeah, I, I think that there are several things, first of all. There's a lot of pre-maintenance that actually goes on. So a lot of our file-based systems and SANS are actually analyzing our disk drives and testing their performance. So quite often, we can diagnose a drive is going to fail. We can see its read-write performance. We can see memory error start. There's obviously always a lot of memory error mapping and things going on with drives as they start hitting bad sectors or they start misperforming. And quite often, and we, we, we look after quite a lot of large, big SANS out there, and we manage them all remotely, quite often, we are repairing SANS without the customer even knowing it's going wrong. We've got drives going in. So there's a lot of preventative elements in there. And this is where I talked earlier on. It's really important to get your protection back as quickly as possible. But there's a lot of pre preventative uh, stuff that allows us to do that. Um, regarding the futures, well, obviously, you know, if we look at the web and we talk about the cloud, it's all disk drive based. You know, so clearly, they don't have this problem. But then they, they invest into enterprise scaling uh, systems. And you know, we don't talk about RAID here. We, we typically talk about M plus 1, M plus 2. And what we do is we buy scales of redundancy throughout the system so that we can suffer an entire J bar the dry is failing or a whole spread and your investment in that will actually increase your reliability. So that's the way you know the web is getting around this amount of time. They have enterprise scaling. That's obviously very expensive. That's the problem. Um, in regards to the future it's very difficult at this moment in time. You know, you would immediately presume because drives are mechanical, that's the reason why we're getting these errors. Actually, most of the time, it isn't because of mechanical errors. Um, um, but if, that, if it is mechanical, then we think, well, surely SSD, that's going to fix this. We are having so many problems with SSDs at the moment in time. Um, the big problem we have with SSDs is the way they fail. There's no concept in them about to fail. They just don't turn on the next day. So <laughs> they're actually even worse at this moment in time. We've had a lot of bad experiences. Um, and also with SSDs, they have to perform, deteriorate in performance. There's some real issues about how SSD. So we're not quite ready for that. Long-term future, there are technologies um, hiding away out there at this moment in time. Um, there was a technology shown in holographic memory, um, which is, believe it or not, very interesting. Uh, I did get involved in a project many, many years ago in atomic memory where we actually dope um, atomic cells. And we was involved where we actually created a binary gate 
that actually lived, changed its state. Um, and the belief is that in the future, so I think uh, we talked about exabytes and the Library of Congress. So the great example was with atomic memory, we can actually put the entire Library of Congress in one centimeter cube. So that's the future. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> about um, LTO, and we've mentioned that LTO is kind of guaranteed for uh, 50 years. Um, do we think that technology seems to be changing quite a lot over the last couple of years so quickly? Do we think that now we're at maybe at a plateau where LTO is going to become the standard for at least, what, uh, five years? How long should I buy it for? Well, yeah, I think maybe five years uh, at the moment, but I, I definitely think there's a gap in the market for someone to come up with a better product. Absolutely, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't take it as a really long-term investment. But I mean, whatever you do on it, you're going to have to keep yeah, on it. Have to take it as a long-term <laughs> No, not, not with technology. Um, and just uh, back to John, actually, thinking about production companies, I think from what we found in, in what we do is that um, going tapeless and all of these, and, and budgets going down, we found that you can't, you can't really afford to buy into this kit on your one production. It makes it very, very expensive, because now you can't just buy tapes whereas you buy a mini DVD for a pound, now you need to buy an SBS card, which can cost you two, three, four hundred pounds. And you need multiples of those. We send our guys out with eight. So we're looking at thousands of pounds, and we couldn't afford to buy each individual production on the production budget that. So we've actually started to bring this into capital expenditure, so the company buys them and hires them back. Is that something that you think, well, do you, is that something that you do, and do you think that's something that, one of the problems is, is that the larger companies can weather the storm, I think, but the smaller yeah. companies, it's really restrictive. It is difficult because it's hard to know what you can buy and actually get your return on when technology is changing so much. Um, but with things like media, um, yes, I mean, we have bought a whole heap of cards which we were using. If you are on a small production, if, you, if you're not in a company where you can afford to, to buy, whether it be the cameras or the media, um, you do have the option to hire them. You just have to try and get as good a deal as you can on a, on a production. So instead of just paying you know, a, their day rate, if you know you're going to commit your whole production to them just try and get a deal like a buyout on that particular production so yes if you can afford to buy it and you know you're going to be doing more and more productions and therefore you can get a return on your investment then great but if not the option to hire is there um, for those that can't afford to buy it um, so I think there are you know that there is a solution for those um, that are maybe making a one-off production can't afford to buy it all on that one budget um, and just staying with you, this is a question that actually Mark was very good at as well, but I know, I know you can answer it. Um, are you finding that broadcasters are being particularly supportive about the fact that as producers really we, we're kind of entering a whole new world and no one's really holding our hands? <laughs> Do you think the broadcasters are, I, I know the DPP, the Digital Production Partnership, mm -hmm. and the collection of all the broadcasters, they're starting to kind of come together and realise what we're going through or what we have been going through the last couple of years. Yeah. But do you, do you feel, from your experience at Maverick, are the broadcasters now kind of cottoning on and starting to, to understand that your budget needs to change, your schedule needs to change, you need to rethink how you actually make programmes? I think that the broadcasters have been as understanding as they possibly can. Um, I think that maybe a year ago it was quite tricky and that decisions weren't being made. So if we had, um, I don't know, if we had an ITV commission, I'd ring up and say, is this camera acceptable? They'd say, I don't know what the BBC doing. I mean, and that was like, <laughs> well, I'm making a production for you. I start filming on Monday. I don't have a camera. Um, so it wasn't that I think that there was a deliberate unhelpfulness. I think it was just uh, this great decision had been made that we wanted it HD but actually nobody really knew what they wanted from you and the cameras didn't exist in the market so I think that all of that didn't really come together very well um, I, it's difficult times at the moment broadcasters aren't giving any uplift now or maybe some companies are lucky enough to get it we're not one of them we've had no uplift for HD at all there's a lot of rumors flying about that it's cheaper um, you know to do tapeless so therefore nobody believes that actually when you break all these things down there is actually extra cost there um, so we're not getting any extra money um, and we're not getting that much help but I think that there is a, a level of patience and understanding um, which has certainly gone some way to making it a little bit less painful so uh, thank my speakers John, Jess and Donna and um, thank you all for coming this afternoon